And I'm sure that we will have a very uh, productive discussion because all the discussions this week have been absolutely fascinating. If you want to ask a question, either raise your hand or put it in chat. It might be useful if you ask a question in chat, but you're not able to actually speak it, that you say, please read this question for me, because otherwise I'll, I'll ask you to repeat it. It's just a useful way of uh, knowing who wants. Um, and follow up questions or other questions can of course all be discussed in the Slack channel. The talks will be recorded and we'll start the recording um, at the point where I introduce the first speaker. And we have uh, four speakers in this session, but don't forget that also, I'll, I'll remind you again later, there is a, a final discussion session on, on Supergiants uh, at the end of uh, the, the, well, the morning in my time zone, whatever time zone it is for you. So at the moment we have, uh, wow, we have 44 people. And I, I, I see some people who got up very early from the US, I think. <laughs> Good morning. And, and probably some people staying up late from the other side of the world. Um, okay, so I'll give it a couple of minutes and according to my clock, it's 18 minutes past. Oh, the other thing to tell all speakers is that I will give you a two minute warning before your time is up. So that's 20 minutes for Katerina and 15 minutes for everybody else. And I will be fairly strict at, at cutting the discussion off on time or cutting the speaker off if I haven't managed to stop them sooner because the way that we're doing this remotely, it, it's really difficult for people if we don't keep to time, if they're only able to attend for one talk because they're teaching or something. So we really do need to keep to the timetable. Okay, so if you'd like to start recording, Tosa, and I will introduce uh, Katerina. She's at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Uh, and as an invited speaker, Katerina is going to tell us about the tomography of evolved star atmospheres. Thank you, Katerina. So I can start, yes? <laughs> yes, please. Okay. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Katerina and I'm postdoc at uh, NP. And first of all, I would like to thank to the organizers for the opportunity to present my work at this conference. And today I will talk about tomography of evolved star atmospheres. Okay, so as we know, HB and red supergiant stars uh, represent late stages of evolution of low and high mass stars. Uh, this table summarizes main physical properties of these stars compared to those of our sun. So you can see that HBs and red supergiants are, are characterized by high luminosities, low effective temperatures, low surface gravities, which result in extended atmospheres of an order of few hundred of solar radii. Uh, interferometric observations of these stars revealed presence of large convective cells covering their surface and in addition, the atmospheres of HBs and red supergiants are characterized by very complex velocity fields, which affects the depths, the shapes, and the Doppler shifts of spectral lines. So a good understanding of HB and red supergiant stars is very important in the context of a broad range of astrophysical questions, such as chemical enrichment of the universe, supernova progenitors, and the extra galactic distance scale. However, their main properties, such as uh, photometric variability and mass loss, are still poorly constrained. Thus, the main goal of my research is to characterize atmospheric motions in HB and red supergiants in order to better understand the mechanisms behind their photometric variability and mass loss. And this can be done with help of tomography. So tomography is a powerful technique 
which is currently used in a broad range of scientific areas. Uh, for example, in medicine, with the help of computer tomography, we can obtain images of different slices from a human body. And the method is also successfully used in climatology and astronomy. And uh, as I will show later, with our implementation of a tomographic method, we can make images of the slices from a stellar atmosphere and recover velocity field within each atmospheric slice. So how tomography works? As a first step, we construct 1D synthetic spectrum using 1D Marx model atmospheres and radiative transfer code turbo spectrum. As next step, we identify the depths of formation of spectral lines with, this, with the help of a contribution function. The contribution function can be displayed as a three-dimensional surface of which a local maximum is a function of the optical depth scale, which we compute at a reference wavelength of 5,000 angstrom. So the maximum of a contribution function in the optical depth and wavelength plane, shown here as a red line, defines a depth function, which tells us at which optical depth a spectral line forms. Indeed, if we compare the depth function to the synthetic spectrum, we can see that the cores of spectral lines form in outer atmospheric layers characterized by low optical depths, while the wings of spectral lines are forming in the inner atmospheric layers characterized by large optical depths. Uh, so when the depth function is computed, we can split atmosphere into different slices. Here they are shown as colored bands, and for each slice we construct mask. And each mask contains wavelength of lines whose depth function minima fall within restricted range of optical depths. Finally, when our masks are constructed, we can cross-correlate them with either observed or synthetic stellar spectra, and resulting cross-correlation function profiles will provide us the average shape and velocity of lines within each atmospheric slice. So the tomographic method was originally designed and applied to pulsating KGB stars of uh, Maria Kind uh, by Alvarez et al. in 2001 in order to locate and follow the propagation of a shock wave through their atmospheres. So the figure here illustrates cross-correlation functions for a Maira star LT Cygni. Uh, here, different columns correspond to different observing epochs and different rows correspond to different masks. So the innermost atmospheric layer is shown at the top and the outermost atmospheric layer is shown at the bottom. Uh, in this figure, you can see that some uh, cross-correlation functions are double-peaked, and this land doubling is associated with the passage of a shock wave through the atmosphere, which is called Schwarzschild scenario. So according to this scenario, when the shock front is located below the line-forming regions, all lines are redshifted since all the matter is falling down. When shocks start to propagate through the atmosphere, the line exhibits a blue shifted component corresponding to the rising material. And the intensity of the blue shifted component increases with respect to the red shifted component as shock reaches the upper atmospheric layers. And when shock has passed through the atmosphere, all lines are blue shifted. And indeed, uh, you can see that in case of Myra stars, the temporal and spatial evolution of the cross-correlation function profiles nicely illustrates the outward propagation of a shock wave through the atmosphere. So the next part of my talk is dedicated to application of a tomographic method to spectroscopic observations of red supergiant stars. Uh, first, a bit of a context. So we know that uh, red supergiant stars are characterized by irregular and semi-regular photometric variations. Uh, Keyes in 2006 analyzed the light curves of a sample of red supergiants and di discovered two main photometric periods, the short one of an order of a few hundred days and the long one of an order of a few thousand days. Uh, different theories were proposed to interpret these uh, two photometric periods. The short one was proposed to be due to presence of large convective cells or pulsations, while the long period was attributed to binarity or magnetic activity. 
Uh, here in this study, we are focused on a short photometric period and propose a possible explanation for it. To do so, we selected two red supergiant stars, Musephae and Betelgeuse, and observed them with a Hermes spectrograph, which has spectral resolution of 85,000. So we obtained 95 spectra for Musephae and 37 spectra for Betelgeuse, which cover a time span of several years. And the signal to noise ratio of our spectra is about 100. For all the obtained spectra, we aim at deriving the velocity and temperature variation as function of time. So to do so, we constructed a set of five tomographic masks and cross-correlated them with our spectra. Uh, this figure shows example of uh, cross-correlation functions for MUSEVE. Uh, here, different columns correspond to different observing epochs and different rows correspond to different uh, masks. So mask C1 probing the innermost atmospheric layer is shown at the top, and mask C5, which probes the outermost atmospheric layer, is shown at the bottom. And in this figure, you can see that some cross-correlation functions are asymmetric and even double-peaked, which is a result of a complex velocity field in the atmosphere. So as the next step, we used these CCFs to derive velocities at different masks as a function of time. And here are how velocities look like. So the top panel illustrates radial velocity obtained by fitting our cross-correlation functions with a Gaussian. Here, dots correspond to velocities of secondary peaks of double-peaked CCFs. The second panel illustrates radial velocity obtained by computing mean CCF shift. In both panels, color correspond to different masks. So our velocities can be compared to the photometric variations shown here as crosses and to the temperature variations shown as uh, black squares. And the temperature we derived using the available TIO bands in our Hermes spectra. So from this figure, you can see that there is a phase shift between velocity and photometric variations, as well as between the velocity and uh, temperature variations. Uh, this phase like translates into hysteresis loops in the temperature velocity plane. Uh, for MUSEFE, we detect hysteresis loops for three different time regions uh, shown as different columns and as uh, gray shaded areas on the light curve. So the time scales of our loops are 552, 310, and 840 days. And at least one of them is very close to the short photometric period of MUSFE derived by Keys in 2006. However, you can see that this part of the light curve is quite irregular and shorter periods can be identified, thus confirming the link between the uh, photometric and hysteresis loop timescales. So similar result we get for Betelgeuse. Again, we observe a phase shift between temperature and velocity variations, as well as between temperature, between photometric and velocity variations. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to discuss the great dimming here due to limited time, but we can come back to it during questions. So the phase shift results again into hysteresis loops in the temperature velocity plane with the time scales matching the photometric ones. So in order to interpret in the nature of hysteresis loops, we applied tomographic method to snapshots from free radiative hydrodynamic simulations of a red supergiant star atmosphere. So 3D simulations are characterized by realistic input physics and reproduce effects of convection, which plays central role in the structure, uh, the dynamics and the appearance of evolved stars. So here we performed analysis in the same way as was done for Betelgeuse and the MUSFAE. So we constructed a set of synthetic uh, spectra and cross-correlated them with our tomographic masks. The resulting cross-correlation functions were used to derive velocities in different atmospheric layers, and the TAO bands were used to derive temperatures. And this is what simulation shows. 
Again, we detect phase lag between temperature, velocity, and uh, photometric variations, which results in hysteresis loops, which are very similar to those which we saw in Musafei and Betelgeuse. And moreover, the time scales of this hysteresis loop is matching the photometric time scale of the simulation. So this table shows a qualitative comparison of radial velocity extent, temperature extent, and time scales of observed and, history and simulated hysteresis loops. So you can see that they show very similar qualitative behavior, which means that by understanding the nature of hysteresis loops in 3D simulation, we can better understand and interpret those which occur in real stars. And the use of 3D simulations gives us excellent opportunity to actually see how velocity and temperature behave along the hysteresis loops. So this figure illustrates uh, velocity maps for different uh, 3D snapshots along the hysteresis loop. Uh, here, blue colors correspond to the rising material and red colors correspond to the falling material. And this figure illustrates a clear distinction between the upper and lower parts of the history this loop, this upper part characterized by mostly blue shifted velocities. Uh, this figure illustrates temperature maps for different snapshots along the loops. And here, brighter colors correspond to higher temperatures. And this figure allows us to make a distinction between the left and the right part of history this loops with the right part characterized by higher temperatures. Uh, these temperature maps can also be used as proxy for the surface intensity, which means that appearance and disappearance of bright areas on these maps is responsible for the surface brightness variations. So to summarize what we see in, so according to velocity and temperature maps, the appearance of a warm, bright areas on the stellar surface is followed by the rising of a material at the same location. And this accounts for the phase lag between velocity and temperature variations and in turn for the hysteresis loops. So according to the dynamical picture in 3D simulation, the, the hysteresis loops can be interpreted as follows. Uh, convection produces acoustic waves in the stellar interior. Then this, uh, these waves travel through the star until they reach the surface and turn into shocks. The shocks in turn uh, transfer the heat through the photosphere, producing surface brightness variations and thus hysteresis loops. It, this means that hysteresis loops may be triggered by the acoustic waves, which in turn might account for the short period photometric variations in red supergiant stars. In the next few slides, I would like to briefly introduce you a different application of a tomographic method, but to you by using spectral interferometric observations of evolved stars. Uh, the combination of spectral interferometric observations with the tomographic method opens a new way to study the structure and dynamics in evolved stars. So I, as I will show later, by measuring stellar radius in different masks, we can recover a link between optical and geometrical depth scales. The knowledge of this relation has several implications. First, we would get access to an extra dimension, depth. Uh, second, it would allow us to directly test and constrain current 1D and 3D dynamical model atmospheres. And finally, in the context of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, present uh, study, uh, the knowledge of the relation between optical and geometrical depths would allow us in future to derive shock wave velocity in Myra stars by combining the geometrical depth measurements from interferometry and the time scales of the shock propagations, which can be derived from the time series spectroscopy. So for this particular study, we selected a Myra star as ORI due to availability of high resolution VLTI ember observations. As a first step, we constructed a set of three tomographic masks. And then for each line in a given mask, we measured interferometric diameter of S-ORI 
using a uniform disk model, which is a geometrical model assuming a circularly symmetric source with a uniform brightness distribution. And this figure shows our resulting uniform disk uh, diameters in different tomographic masks as a function of wavelength. And you can see that our uniform disk diameters increase from mask C1 to mask C3, confirming the ability of our tomographic masks to probe distinct geometrical depths in the atmosphere. A similar procedure was applied to 1D pulsating codex models and 3D radiative hydrodynamic simulations, with both the stellar parameters similar to those of S. Ori. And again, you can see from these uh, plots that uh, similar to S. Ori, our masks probe distinct geometrical depths in the stellar atmosphere. Finally, this figure uh, some, uh, shows the uniform disk diameter measured with interferometry versus optical depth scale provided by tomography for S ORI and dynamical models. And you can see that the, the uniform, the UD diameter increases with decreasing optical depth. And this provides us link between the optical and geometrical depth scales. So here are the conclusions of uh, my talk. So I presented a tomographic method and uh, showed that it is a powerful tool to recover velocity fields at different depths in the stellar atmosphere. The application of a tomographic method to two red supergiant stars, Misophia and Betelgeuse, revealed presence of hysteresis loops in the temperature velocity plane with the time scales matching the photometric ones. And the comparison with 3D simulations showed that the hysteresis loops might be triggered by acoustic waves, which in turn might be responsible for short period photometric variations in these stars. And finally, the application of a tomographic method to spectra interferometric observations allow us to recover a link between optical and geometrical depth scales. And in future, this, the knowledge of this relation will allow us to better test current dynamical models and ultimately compute derive the velocity, the shock wave velocity in Myra stars. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Katerina, for a, an extremely interesting talk. Um, please do uh, either raise your hand or put something in the chat if you've got a question. I don't know whether Silke sees any raised hands. I, anybody want to... Um, come in on this? Yes, uh, Lee Patrick. Um, do I? Yes. Yes, go, go ahead, uh, Lee. Okay, thanks. Hi, Katerina. Th thanks for the really excellent talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, was, I was sort of wondering, based on the sort of different uh, masks you construct, would it be possible to sort of construct a mask that essentially minimizes the atmospheric variability of, of these atmospheres? Uh, actually, the aim of our mask is to probe this atmospheric variability. So, and uh, what we see that uh, due to dynamical processes occurring in the atmosphere, basically all spectra lines are affected. So if you want, I mean, it would be very difficult to, to compensate for it in the innermost layers where you have really multiple velocity components and uh, you have rising and falling materials. So it's very hard to, to disentangle. In outer layers, it's there is more or less symmetric profiles, which of course, if you measure, then you can, uh, you, 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 you can do the compensation. But initial idea of the method is to, to, to probe the dynamics and actually see if the lines, uh, how the lines are affected by dynamical processes. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, are there any uh, further questions? Uh, Lee, would you like to lower your hand? If, sorry, it's just a, a, a general reminder to people after you put your hand up, please, can you? Um, thank, thank. <laughs> yes, I, I, I always forget myself. 
Are there There's any... a question in the chat, Anita? Ah, yes. Um, okay. Also, hi. Uh, hi, would, would you like to ask the question yourself or would you like me to read it, Sir Claire? Okay, sure. Okay, so, so this is a question from um, uh, Fateni Laiku, who uh, says, thank you for a very nice talk. Maybe I missed this, but what was the basis for the selection of the three different time frames? Was it the duration of the Hermes observations? Uh, wait, let me go back. Uh, if I'm correct, it's uh, it's about these three time time frames, time ranges for which the hysteresis loops are uh, constructed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. well, why did you select the particular three time frames? Uh, basically, uh, I mean this uh, this can be done even uh, arbitrarily. As f basically, uh, one hysteresis loops corresponds to one full cycle, so we selected them by. Uh, looking at our uh, observation and trying to, to, to select some starting position at a, on the light curve and then go through the full cycle. So basically when the photometry returns back to the same, uh, same magnitude and this defines our hysteresis loop. Basically the full photometric cycle is hysteresis loop. And basically independently where you start, from which uh, part you start, you you, you recover the loop anyway. So here was, for example, from uh, somewhere in the middle, not even at a maximum. And uh, basically we selected the magnitude and we come back to the same magnitude. Same for this one and for this one. Okay, thanks very much indeed. I think we can move on to the next speaker. Uh, don't forget there's the Slack channel for following up um, uh, questions and, and discussion. Uh, so our next speaker will be uh, Guillermo Quintana Lacacci. I, I hope I yeah, didn't mispronounce that. No, it's perfect. Um, who is at uh, the Institute for Fundamental Physics at CSIC in Spain. Um, we good. actually, I, I, there's about um, 30 seconds left to go. So you, you can uh, start, uh, start slightly leisurely. Thank you very much, Gear Thank you very much, Bas. Uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, well, I'm looking weird, but I won't change that. Uh, thank you to the organization for giving me the opportunity to present this work or, or results on BYCMA. Uh, this is somehow complementary to the talk given yesterday by Roberta. Uh, she talked on the infrared, and now we will talk on our results on the molecular emission and what we see and how we interpret that. Um, oh, as we've been talking for the last days, uh, uh, one main point for us is how these objects are supergiant lose mass. Now we uh, have the, uh, well, we've been discussing that. Uh, for sure, we know the ATV mechanism doesn't work, but they lose mass and they lose a lot, a lot of mass. And so we have to look to the mass loss of these objects, the structure, to try to see what mechanisms are behind that. Um, some of them, some opinion I'm reading, some of them have been said today, also have other waves and so on, are for instance, uh, convective cells in better use have been observed and they can create a descended atmosphere where you can uh, create dust and then you have a mass ejection, and a, a accidental ejections, it will form an homogeneous um, envelope along the subjects. Uh, but the point is that for BYCMA, this was found not to work because the, the structure, this figure here was presented actually by, by Roberta yesterday, for instance, in the millimeter wavelengths. These structures here are, uh, the, uh, the, the time scales to form those, those are uh, decades, okay? So it's hard to believe that a convective cell will maintain a gold spot during decades. So it was proposed by Orman and Blemings uh, that maybe there are long-lived uh, migratory dynamical disturbances that create cold spots, long-lived cold spots that could lead to mass, mass ejections that would finally form these localized mass ejections. So let's go for what we have. This, as I mentioned, 
the color map is from the HST. You see the arcs in the, in, at the other regions. And this here is what you see in the millimeter domain. This is from Ganinsky in, in 2019. So we went to observe the same region with higher spatial resolution, but apart from the continuum, so it's certain lines. And this is what we got for the continuum, basically the same structure with uh, the spatial resolution at around 30 million seconds. You see, this is the source VY, this is clamp C, and this, this northern blob. This is for the continuum, but we have what happened if you look for the for the molecules. As Roberta said yesterday, this object is, is really complex in the profiles and is rich in, in molecules. So this is an example of some of the lines we saw. This in the upper panel, you have a water maser, which is close to the tar, it's barely resolved. And well, it, it appears what it's meant to be, it is was meant to be around the, the photosphere of the star. So and this is sodium chloride, which is you look at the contours, by the way, is the continuum. Yeah? And the colors is the molecular emission. Here you have sodium chloride, which traces somehow the continuum in the inner regions. This is SIO, which is far more extended. Actually, we're missing flux. But the box, by the way, the boxes are one, uh, one per one million seconds. Yeah? And you see that there are holes where you have the continuum. And contrary to that, this is H2S, H2S traces well, quite well the continuum. So what we first made was uh, try to understand what was this continuum emission and what it were from the H2 maps. And we obtained a position velocity diagram along C, along CAM C. This is what we saw. This is a, a this is a, the model we fed and it's a Hubble-like uh, expansion velocity, okay? So the, the velocity is, is getting larger as you move outwards from the source. So also we made the same from the Northern uh, blob. We found the same also, we found that there were more uh, jets. And as the structure was kind of tricky to interpret, we well, actually, I built up a program to create 3D, or 3D structures out from the cubes, from the Alma cubes. And we'll build this, which is the H2S emission. Okay. This program is called a structure CC GitHub. I have forgot to put the, the link, but if anyone is in, interested, it's, it's really helpful to realize all what's going on. So I will go back to the video with once more. Here's clam C, here's another one, and two going to the rear part. One to just the rear part, one to the rear. West, no, east, sorry. Yep. So this will be the northern one, slightly tilted to us. This is a Cam C. It will be slightly tilted to the back of the, of the star and two more ejections in these two directions. There are also some bubble like outflows, but we don't know if those are bubble like. Uh, this, I mean, this is, just, is real or is that we are missing some emission because actually H2S is relatively weak. Okay, this is for H2S. This is not converted to a 3D uh, structure because the velocity field of SO is extremely complex. But uh, if you look, uh, I will put another one later. This is with five sigma. You see some structure, some hollows as we've seen before. And we go to 10 sigma. In particular, you see here, this looks like a half pipe. So we try just to try to compare both emissions, assuming that every emission has the same uh, velocity field as H2S. And this is what we saw. The mixer is a bit complex because it overplots itself with well. So, but well, in any case, you see that this rear outflow seems to be surrounded by SO. Okay? So this is SO2, which also, seems to appear at different directions. So at different regions, we do not have H2S. So just by inspecting this, you see that you have two types of, of ejecta around there. One, which presents SO and SO2, both SO and SO2 trace the same regions with different signal to noise, depending on the lines we observe, but just the same regions. And complementary to those, we have H2S, okay? 
the same happens with SIO. SIO goes uh, in the same regions with uh, SO, SO2, and seems to be uh, complementary to S2S. Okay. In order to have a better idea of, of what are these holes we see in, in SO2, no, sorry, in SO2, in SO2, we plot these maps, trying to play a bit with the, with the contrast. And we saw here, there's a kind of shell in the northern regions. At a certain moment, well, this is the same shell. They start having, this will be the half pipe you saw. Also here, this kind of bubble around here. This also to the, to the west. And at the last channels, you see another shell appearing for just a while here. Uh, this looks really similar to what we see in H2S. The problem is that we don't kind of compare channel by channel because the velocity fields of the two of the two emissions might be different. This looks completely like we having a, a mass ejection reaching SO that has been carved out by H2S. Actually, it was said uh, by around the, uh, 2013 that what they saw when they did uh, some uh, rotational diagrams of to study SO and SO2, they said that this material, because of the density and temperatures, seemed to be swept up or shock material, which is what we're saying actually. And this is, as I said, playing a bit with the with or with the velocity fields and with the channels to try to overlap uh, or s 2 s emission, which is, will be the red contours around here, with the SO. As, as you can see, will be the northern one. This is clamp C being surrounded. This is the rear one that lasts until the end. And well, this one I wasn't able to fit very well, but this is here, but you see the signs of this carving, okay? Uh, something that also was kind of uh, puzzling to us is that the ejecta, in particular clamp C, but the rest as well, look relatively flat. This flatness didn't look as coming from the, the three reconstruction itself. We played a bit with that. We tried to check it was uh, the impulse of the, how we impose the velocity field and so, but we tend to think that this is real. So we will start to think like, what might be this uh, telling us. Yeah? So we just were thinking, okay, we, fa we have this flatness might be a consequence of, let's say, rotation. Maybe this mag magneto ionical disturbances mentioned by Orman and Lemmings are maintained as long as the, the rotation of the star itself might provide an imprint on this ejector. So we just made, uh, try to look for a way to rotate the star to look for a rotation axis to see if we could show all the ejections as coming from a, a single plane in latitude, okay? This is this one, uh, seems to look fine, okay? Seems to, uh, this is rotating like 95 degrees, if I remember correctly. That means that the source actually is with its pole looking to us, okay? So in order to also to check this out once more, we try to decide to create a simple toy model to see if with uh, this rotation and this ejection for a certain latitude for a certain time, we could create this kind of things. So we, this is a, just a, a to show that you will see. You have an ejection and from then on, it, it evolves with a given velocity field, okay? To form a certain structure. And we try to use this to see if this flatness and this way of creating these structures will work. This is just this, nothing with uh, do with shocks and aerodynamics, just a toy model to see if this looks in the right direction. And it seems to be in the right direction. So you have H2S rotated for the three different angles. And this is one to see more of the structure and the different outflows. So was also thinking on the velocity field we found uh, the proposition by Orman on the man, uh, this cold spots maintained for decades. Uh, if you have that, you will expect to have a, a velocity field more similar to an AGV. I mean, because reaching a, a terminal velocity, not a hubble like uh, velocity field as we see here. Uh, so we try to look for other options uh, different from that. and. We check for the momentum 
that we have here, we know from the works, we have to know the mass of this whoop from this uh, ejection. This is cram seek, which is a more easy to, to study because it's isolated from the rest. And we derive this momentum, which is uh, similar to those sometimes you derive for planet, protoplanetary nebulae. And just thinking on this work from uh, Argyrofi that coronal mass ejections could be a cause of mass loss in active stars. So, well, let's try if uh, coronal mass ejections in this type of objects could work. So, we've tried to uh, had no explore what we know from the sun to these objects and try to see how high should be the magnetic field to be to power this momentum so, and so these ejections. And we derive a magnetic field of five kilohouse, which uh, from the work from Sinaga et al. Uh, uh, it can be it can be given. No? If they derive a uh, six fifty uh, Gauss at five hundred AU, and two, say, two minutes. Okay, thank you. I, I want to thank finish. you. So they say that could be they could reach twenty uh, kilo Gauss at the surface, and actually they said that the most probably BYSME will show localized uh, strength, uh, I mean, localized strength of of this mass. Uh, sorry, of this. Uh, magnetic field. Okay, so everything goes in the right direction. One thing we should be able to look when these erosions take place is this called plasma uh, predicted by C the CMAs of 4 mega K. So they will destroy uh, all the molecules and we'll see X rays or whatever. Though X rays haven't been observed in this solid, but maybe it wasn't the right timing when the solids were made. Well, as Holly said for NLC, if it's the same, the, the structure is really complex. So uh, obtaining uh, uh, Variating temperatures and densities from the profiles can be somehow tricky. So we're aiming now at obtaining right rotational diagrams to obtain temperature and densities in 3D, okay? From the different channels, uh, maps and different molecules. This is a test we made for uh, sodium chloride, uh, V was equal one. This is a, a temperature from these two emissions, temperature map. The point is that these two emissions were relatively close in, in energy. So this is just a test, okay? For that, we have asked for time for our model. And well, just to wrap up, uh, we can identify quite well two types of mass process, mass loss processes. One quiescent and slow for a um, flash supergiant with a uh, mass, I'm sorry, expansion velocity of 30 something, 40, okay? That maybe come from convective cells, turbulence as we uh, heard the other day in, in this talk. And also we have fat collimated all flows that could be magnetic driven all flows. Cold spots, as I mentioned, cold spots as those uh, suggested by Orman, I think is not the case because of the velocity field. Could be uh, coronal mass ejections, maybe other, who knows, no? but this is what we've seen. Also, one would wonder, can wonder if the flatness we've seen is real, if the sprinkler model is actually real, is something related with rotation, this flatness, or is not, is something related with the ejection itself. But for now, we, this is what we have, and we have we have asked for time for ARMA to observe again SO, H2S, and other lines, SO2, SIO, and some more to confirm the structures and, as I mentioned, to derive uh, densities and temperature maps of the data. So we try to create this 3D, but of temperature and, and maps, and try to see the temperatures and conditions of this region and what could be, be behind. And this project was uh, was uh, granted. Uh, to be observed at ALMA, but due to the COVID, it has not been observed yet. Luckily, we will have some data, and for sure, I, I will resubmit, and hopefully, we'll get some data and get more things like this to show you in next in the future. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, any, any questions are for sure welcome. Th thank you very much indeed. That uh, I wish we could clap, but uh, <laughs> take it as take it as read. <laughs> Um, so, are there any questions? Please raise your hands or just make a note in the chat. If if not, just to get things going, I, I, I'd like to make a, a quick co couple of comments and, and a question. Comment one is that maser proper motions don't show any signs of systematic rotation, um, oh. although that could partly be a, a, a projection effect. but. The water mazes are more irregular and, and there are hints of a kind of localized rotation, which might be some sort of dis disturbance, more so than in other supergiants even. 
Um, mm. the, the other thing is that the um, Shinaga et al. results on the magnetic field is a bit ambiguous because the velocity resolution that they had at that epoch was very coarse. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into it, but basically the, I think that um, Shinaga et al. have got time for a re-observation, so that may be subject to confirmation. Mm. But the main question I wanted to ask was, did you see any relation between your arcs and the arcs from the HST images from um, Humphreys et al. And, and Smith et al. and so on? Because that, uh, that would be a really interesting thing. Sure, sure. The thing is that if we assume, well, I try to go, so we just keep wanted to be, okay. Um, if, da, da, da. here, okay. So uh, if we are saying that we have in some kind of flat uh, ejections with this, this shape of uh, H2S, it uh, looks like this, okay. All uh, in, if we assume again with resultation, maybe it's, there's not the resolution, but they all look to be uh, in as in planes uh, latitude, assuming that the pole of the star is looking to us. If we have this, this will probably this is something I would like actually. I, I, I emailed yesterday Roberta to talk to the, about this. Maybe later on the discussion we can talk a bit more. Maybe this could be also the same type of features, but more evolved, okay? Coming from previous uh, events like this. And actually, maybe some of the um, of the substructures you see in, in the SO that are not related to, to H2S, like this one here, so to the south, okay? This could be, due, maybe it could also be due to uh, one of these, the, the southern blob. Maybe this is also, uh, I don't, this fast ejection we don't see in H2S by whatever reason, and has formed this. So this some of the things that we have to check for sure, to, to, to try to get a, a global idea of what's going on from the past to now. No? Okay, thank, that, that, thanks very much. I'm sorry, I asked a very long question. Is, no, is really there not. anybody else with a question there? It's time for one quick question before we I, move I'll, on. I'll be around in a case, so. Sure, and there's the, there's the discussion after uh, break. Sure. But, um, is, is there anybody else who wants to come in? No. Okay. Uh, Stop. Um, I don't see. Yes, I don't see anyone. Okay. So um, in that case, if the next speaker, uh, if Emily would like to um, uh, get ready. Yes, good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So uh, and Emily um, Cannon at... Uh, Kay Lurban is going to tell us about Antares. Uh, thank you, Emily. All right. Thanks, Anita. So um, my name is Emily. I'm a final year PhD student at KU Leuven. And today I'm going to talk to you about the dust that we can see in the inner wind of Antares with VLT sphere. So we've had a lot of great red supergiant talks today, so I won't spend too long on the introduction. Just want to go through a bit the importance of um, red supergiant mass loss. So during their time in the red supergiant phase, massive stars experienced powerful stellar winds, um, ranging from 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus four solar masses per year, um, before eventually exploding as supernova. So these winds and the eventual supernova um, ejecta um, inject newly processed um, elements into the interstellar medium. As these stars do lose a significant amount of their stellar mass, um, in this phase, it can have a large impact on stellar evolution. And I think as Miguel um, was talking about earlier, there's the red supergiant problem um, where we see a lack of observed progenitors above, um, set, above initial masses of 17 solar masses. So perhaps this could go some way in explaining that. Um, so the mass loss during the red supergiant phase um, can also influence the supernova properties, um, which we've seen earlier with um, the light curves of different supernova with um, different mass loss rates. And it can also de um, determine the nature of the compact remnant left behind. So here, I'm just gonna show a schematic of a red supergiant wind. So here we have our um, star, our inner wind, our intermediate wind and our outer wind. 
So from our intermediate wind, we know that molecules have formed dust and that radiation pressure on the dust can further drive the wind. What we don't know, however, is what, um, what is triggering the mass loss in the inner wind. So there's um, several different theories. So one of, it, one of them it could be that it is the dissipation of alpha wind waves in the chromosphere. Another is that a surface activity could be involved. So like the upwelling of um, subsurface convective cells could lower the um, local effective gravity, allowing radiation pressure to launch material. Building further on this, um, Dylan Key, who gave a talk on day two, um, um, has a theoretical prescription where turbulent pressure um, launches the wind. They don't go into the origin of um, this turbulent pressure, um, but it's suggested that this could also um, be caused by su subsurface activities such as the surfacing of um, large convective cells. So I encourage you to um, have a look at Dylan's talk if you uh, missed it on day two. So as I said earlier, we had a lot of nice talks on red supergiants. So I just wanted to highlight two where it shows the presence of clumps um, in the winds of red supergiants. So the first one we had this morning uh, with Miguel presenting Betelgeuse and the dimming being caused by a clump of dust. And secondly, we have um, seen v um, a talk from Roberta Humphreys yesterday on VYCMA, where we've seen um, large clumps around the star as well. So um, the question is, um, do all red supergiants exhibit, exhibit similar behaviors? So to investigate um, the mass loss origin of red supergiants, we need to look at high angular resolution observations. So here I just have a map of um, uh, galactic red supergiants. Uh, so you can see the plane in the Milky Way and our Magellanic clouds here um, and how we can resolve them. Um, so using adaptive optics, so direct imaging, um, we are able to resolve the photosphere of three red supergiants. There's Betelgeuse over here. And if you see in blue here, these are um, the stars that we can still use adaptive optics to resolve their inner envelopes. Um, sorry, I should have mentioned that um, each of these points is um, scaled to the angular diameter of the star. So the bigger the point, the bigger the star. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, Antares. So just a quick um, run through the numbers for Antares. Um, it has a radius of 680 solar radii. It is the closest red supergiant at 170 parsecs. And it has a temperature of around 3600 Kelvin. Um, as Emily um, Levesque spoke about yesterday, that um, uh, red supergiants often have um, B star companions, and so does Antares. Um, so the separation here is about 2.3 arc seconds, which is about 224 AU. For the purpose of this talk and the observations we have of the inner wind, um, we don't think this companion has a major influence on our observations. So we observed Antares um, using Sphere Zimple, uh, which uses adaptive optics to correct for turbulence in the atmosphere, um, allowing an angular resolution of around 25 milli arc seconds to be achieved. Um, so Sphere, uh, Sphere looks in the spectral range of 500 to 900 um, nanometers, and we get from Sphere we get intensity and polarization images. So here, I just wanted to show you that with Sphere, we're able to resolve Antares. So on the left here, we have our calibrator star, um, oh, sorry, um, Epsilon SCO. Its diameter here is shown in green of six milli arc seconds. And as you can see here, we're retrieving the point spread function of the telescope. On the right, we have um, one of the filters that we observed in, the V filter, um, um, image of Antares. Um, in the white here is the beam size for this observation. It's about 27 milli arc seconds. The green circle indicates the diameter of Antares in the near infrared, um, which is 37 milli arc seconds. And here we have our star. So as you can see that this photosphere is um, just about resolved with our beam size being slightly smaller than the um, diameter of our star. So I said that with sphere, we not only get intensity images, we also get polarization um, images. Um, so this polarization can be caused by the scattering of light of dust grains. What I'm going to be talking a lot about is the degree of linear polarization. So this is basically the percentage of the light which is polarized, um, which helps us pick up um, the fainter polarization signals and enables dust detection. 
The degree of polarization is highly scattering angle dependent, which um, we can see from this plot down here from Curvella 2008, um, with the highest polarization being caused with, um, with scattering angles of around 90 degrees. Obviously, um, the amplitude of um, your polarization is also dependent on many other factors, such as your, um, your grain composition, your size, and things like that. So here we have our observations. On the top row, we have our intensity images. On the bottom, we have our um, degree of linear polarization. Again, with our beam size in white and our diameter marked in green. So we can see across all six filters that we have um, a bright patch to the south of the star. So what we wanna do now is um, model this dust um, to see whether we can um, constrain any of the properties such as the 3D position and the size of the, um, the dust clump. We do this using um, a 3D Monte Carlo radiative transfer code called MCMAX3D. Um, we model, our model consists of a star and um, a singular clump, um, uh, which is spherical and has a constant density. So for our stellar parameters, we get our um, effective temperature from uh, matching a Crookes model to our sphere photometry. We take our luminosity and distance from literature. Our dust geometry is our variable, so our 3D position, our dust mass, and our clump size. Our grain properties, so our grain size and size distribution and composition, we keep fixed for our grid. But we do um, trial our best fit model, changing the composition to see what, see what effects that has. So from MCMAX, we get out our intensity images, our polarized flux and our dust temperature structure. And we also convolve this with, um, with, with our beam size um, so that we can directly compare our um, models and our observations. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how much the 3D position um, affects our polarization. So if we have our observer here, um, here's our Antares, and if we put a, a clump just in the plane of the star, this is the signal we get from our model. If we move this clump behind, um, you can see that there's a significant drop in the polarization, and it's even more diminished if we move the clump in front. So after running a grid of about 20,000 models, um, this here is our best, um, best result. Um, so on the left here, we have our observations and on the right, we have the model. So we have our intensity, our polarized intensity and our degree of linear polarization. The models were fit on the degree of linear polarization across all six filters. So I want to draw your attention here to this table to what um, is highlighted here in yellow. So the position and the line of sight of our clump shows that um, our clump is always positioned um, behind the star for our best fit models, um, if not only slightly. Um, the radius of our clump um, is quite large, um, exceeding two and a half times the radius of Antares. There's also a significant dust mass in our clump of 0.3 to 1.5 by 10 to the minus eight solar masses. So now I just wanna run you through our main results. So on the left here, we have a schematic of our um, best fit model. So we have our observer, our um, red supergiant and our clump of dust. So uh, as may be obvious from this image that um, a clump of dust is much larger than uh, we would expect probably looking just looking at the image. This is because of the um, optically um, thick nature of the clump and also the preferred scattering angle for polarization of 90 degrees. And um, from the schematic, the distance here between um, the surface of the star and the um, surface of the dust clump is um, less than 0.5 stellar radii, showing that the dust is located very close to the star. The surface covering factor of the clump um, of around 18% um, also agrees well with the expected size of surface convective cells, where it would take six clumps to cover the entire surface of Antares. So here I show a vizier image um, of the outer wind of Antares by Onaka um, 2014. And this image is at 17.7 micron. So what we're seeing these bright spots are large clumps of dust um, and there are six in total. Um, the field of view of this image is about six arc seconds. Um, the, this vizier image and our um, sphere images were taken five years apart. So it is unlikely that our clump uh, existed at the time of this um, um, at, the, at the time of the vizier image. Um, 
but I think we can use it as a, a comparison for a dust clump size. Um, so our dust mass is um, comparable to the clump mass in the outer wind. From the Vizier image, we are able to calculate a, a clump mass loss rate of greater than 1.5 by 10 to the minus 7 solar masses a year using a gas to dust ratio of 200, um, which in itself is very uncertain. We calculate a dust ejection time scale of around five years. So what was not obvious from our sphere observations was the presence of a radial outflow. Um, to try and put some constraints on um, what the gas to dust ratio would have to be um, in an outflow um, starting at five hour start, we ran some, um, ran some MC Max models with a um, spherical outflow starting at five hour star with the mass loss rate of two by 10 to the minus six solar masses per year and we increased the gas to dust ratio. We then took these um, polarization maps and divided them by our error map to see what we could detect. So if you see here in red um, indicates a, a greater than one sigma detection and um, blue indicates a non-detection. Since we do not detect this flow in our sphere images, this suggests that um, for a flow starting this close to the star, we would have to have a gas to dust ratio um, greater than 2000. This suggests that the inner radio flow is unlikely to be dust driven. So in conclusion, um, and as we've seen from a lot of the other talks, um, uh, red supergiant mass loss um, is inhomogeneous and um, consisting of large clumps embedded in a smooth outflow. And the clumps in the inner wind and the outer wind of Antares have compar comparable dust masses. And also the clumps seen for Betelgeuse and Antares also have comparable dust masses. Um, we show that um, dust can form very close to the stellar surface, but the dust formation seems to only be efficient within clumps, um, which could possibly be linked to surface convection. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks very much indeed, Emily. That's a, a fascinating talk. I always think Antares is a bit of a neglected star in our community. <laughs> uh, so are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat yet, and I don't see any hands raised. In which case, I have a very quick one, while people hopefully will pile in, which is, did your um, assumption that the gas to dust ratio was um, uh, greater than 2000, uh, was that assuming it was smooth or did that allow for clumps? That assumed a smooth outflow. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, are there There's a any... hand raised from Boris. Yes. I, okay, go ahead, uh, Boris. Um, hello, very interesting results. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, I'm just wondering, um, do you think it's possible to put additional constraints on um, these dust clumps using infrared spectral energy distribution? Um, for Antares, we haven't um, looked at trying to do that. It would certainly um, help us um, nail down the dust composition. So for example, for this study, we used a clump made of alumina, and then we also ran models um, with silicates as well and found that um, our polarization didn't change too much. So we were unable to um, determine the dust composition. Um, so in that, in that sense, it would be very useful. Mm. Okay, I see. I see. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Uh, are there any more? Are there any questions? Okay, there's a question from Libby. Do you want to say it or shall I read it out? Okay, I'll read it out um, for, 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 from Olivia Jones. Um, I may have missed this, but what is the mechanism for clump formation? Oh, well, that's what we would all like to know, um, the, the mechanism of clump formation. Um, it could be linked to surface convection, but of course we're not 100% sure on this yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess it follows on from the, the previous uh, discussions about convection versus other local disturbances and so on. Um, I, I mean, I, I mean, is there any evidence? I, I, re I remember, but I can't remember the details of Eamon O'Gorman's paper on Antares looking at um, BLA radio continuum. The, can you remember if that gave any clues to what's going on further out in the wind? 
I, I would ha I'd have to have another look at it. Yeah, now. I can't. I, yeah, because <laughs> um, I, 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 do you think that Antares has? Do you, do you think that it's going to evolve into something like Battle Girls or, or VYCMA? Well, or like there is evidence as red supergiants get closer to the supernova um, stage that they can exp experience periods of um, heightened mass loss. Um, so it'll be interesting. Um, obviously, we won't be able to see that. <laughs> Okay, I, I see two further questions. Um, Shazreen first and then Lee. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was wondering if there's any ever, well, plans to investigate. So one of the things we see in the massive star hot winds is that the clumps change as they move radially outwards. And I was wondering if that's something that we could test with observations in the red supergiants or if there's any evidence for that already of how the clump changes uh, the shape and, and size as it moves uh, through further and further from the star. Yeah, so that indeed would be extremely interesting. Um, so we weren't able to compare the size of our clump in the inner wind to the, to the size of the clump in the outer wind because the resolution of his ear is about half an arc second. Um, so it's kind of blurred out. So um, with the um, ELT perhaps in the future, we will be able to get higher resolution and compare it that way or use other instruments. Um, but for Antares right now, we can't um, do that, but also temporal monitoring would be really important for that as well. Thank you. Great, thanks. And, okay, and, and Lee, uh, I think that will need to be the final question so people can do more in the um, Slack channel, Lee. Sounds good. Just a, just a quick one. Re really great talk, by the way, Emily. Um, if, if, so following on from Anita's point, if, uh, if we expect sort of Antares to, you know, get bigger and more like Beetlejuice and, 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 and VYCMA, at that point, will it sort of, will its companion become important in, 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 in these kind of ejections or mass loss episodes? Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure how the um, companion would influence it uh, if the mass loss rate, um, for example, were to um, get larger. Um, it's a bit outside what I've looked at here, um, so I, I don't think I can give you a good answer for that. Cheers. Okay, <laughs> pl 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 plenty to discuss later. Um, so now if you want to stop screen sharing, and sure. Tabisha can... Uh, be uh, ready, please. I think I, I yes, yes, okay, yes, thank you, Tavisha. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, for our, our final talk of this session, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Tavisha Damawadina. And again, I hope that uh, I didn't get that um, too mangled, but please correct me, uh, from the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, who will tell us about Betelgeuse. Yeah, um, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Fine. Thank Great. you. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for having me and letting me give this talk. Um, we were of course, had some wonderful talks on Beetlejuice already. So I'll try and keep this quick and just summarize what we find in the submillimeter um, during the great dimming of Beetlejuice. Um, so of course, we know that there was this great dimming and um, I won't go too much into detail, but if you sort of just look at the light curve presently as well, it, it's still behaving a bit weird, I think. Um, and uh, there was a lot of literature about the great dimming, um, some wonderful work from example, Miguel, um, Graham and um, Emily. And, um, and uh, yeah. So uh, just a quick note on why we actually decided to look in the submillimeter. Um, so I worked on uh, the submillimeter mission and the variability on IRC 10216 and uh, Myra during my PhD. And we saw the significant variability in the star and uh, in both stars. And what we couldn't really, um, well, we couldn't really tie it very concretely into any real uh, uh, sort of uh, process that's happening in the star. Uh, there, there was evidence for dust formation, but there was also evidence for electrospheric interference as well. 
Um, so during, when the great dimming happened, uh, my wonderful colleague at the JCMT um, suggested we start looking at the uh, at Beetlejuice with the JCMT in Hawaii. And um, so what we sort of find with our, just if you look at the observations here um, from the pre-dimming and uh, during the height of the dimming, we don't really see any difference in the image plane. But of course, at 850 microns, we're sort of looking at a uh, 13.5 arc second resolution, so we're not going to really see much. Um, but what we do see is when we look at the light curve was quite surprising to all of us actually when we first saw the results is that we see the submillimeter light curve decreasing. And um, so this was quite surprising because when we started this project, it was mostly to look into the dust because that's where we were all coming from. So we were hoping with the submillimeter, what we would see is that it stayed uh, mostly constant compared to the previous uh, pre-dimming uh, light curve or that it was increased because of some sort of dust emission. But instead, what we saw was there was a decrease. Um, and uh, so we sort of went through this multi-process um, step to come up with our conclusions. And the first was, of course, we needed to confirm that this was indeed a statistically significant decrease. So what we did was we fitted multiple models, uh, including constant flux, linearly changing flux, and two epoch of constant flux with one increase and one decrease. And what we find was um, using nested sampling and a base factor is that uh, the models significantly favored the, the base factor significantly favored the model where we see a decrease in submillimeter. And um, so this was, and the base factor was uh, by, it, the difference was about a hundred, several hundred in factors. Um, so we were quite confident that we do indeed see a st statistically significant decrease in um, the submillimeter flux. So, uh, uh, yeah. and um, so then what we wanted to see is, uh, so what, what is happening with the, with the star and what's happening with the photosphere? So what we did was we modeled the star um, with, uh, with just its regular constant outflow model, but we also had this dust shell added in front, assuming that uh, taking into account this uh, theory that there was this dust ejection. And what we find in the submillimeter is that uh, there is absolutely no change when we include the dust into our model. So which means what we have here is this unique set of data where we see through the dust and the dust doesn't interfere and we see the photosphere very clearly. And we can decide, we've sort of like separated out the effects of dust and we have this nice photospheric um, uh, data set. And um, so this means that also the decrease in submillimeter flux had to be a result of something that's happening on the photosphere. Uh, and uh, so taking this into account, we of course, we've seen some wonderful talks on, um, on like the convective cells and that sort of thing. And um, so we sort of, we were inspired by this and we modeled uh, um, the optical spectra that had been uh, publicly uh, that's um, been available in literature recently. And uh, we use this two component photosphere. And what we do find is that uh, with our pre-dimming and our post-dimming um, uh, models is that, um, that uh, the two component photosphere matches the optical dimming really well. And we recover this, uh, so while we recover the same spectrum, we also find that there's this temperature drop a very significant temperature drop of about 3,450 Kelvin. And this temperature drop is like overall, in, it's a, fl a flux average temperature drop on the total photosphere. So it's taking all the components of this photosphere into account. And um, this was calibrated on pre-dimming spectra that's also available in literature. Um, so we do see this significant temperature drop. And um, there was also this uh, wonderful results by Harper et al. 2021, uh, sorry, this is supposed to be 2020 B. Um, we're using TIO photometry that also came up with a very similar conclusion. And what they also find is that because the TIO lines are quite close together, if dust did play a significant role in this, we would expect the continue, the, um, the full range of the TIO photometry to decrease uh, at about the same amount, but that's not exactly what we see. Um, and also what Harper et al. find is the stellar photospheric temperature drop down again to about 3,500 Kelvin, uh, quite similar to what we find. Um, yeah, so how do we sort of tie this multi-component photosphere together with everything? And what do we think is actually happening here? 
is that, um, so what we think is happening is there must have been some very large cool spots on the star. Um, it had to have covered at least 50% of the star to explain um, the dimming we see in the submillimeter. And also this ties up very nicely with the wonderful images that Miguel has. And um, so if we do think that there is some sort of dust ejection event, then maybe the dust did, there was some dust emitted and it did cool down. But really the only way we could explain such a dimming in the submillimeter would be that the, where we really do pick up the photosphere and it's not interfered with dust is that um, there was this uh, temperature drop on the photosphere itself, which played a very big role. Um, but there's of course still more to do. There's a lot of new data coming out of uh, out from all this. And um, there's a few things we need to consider, like if there was a clump, how far, how fast did it move away? Um, and if, if it did move that fast, like what kind of mechanisms did cause it? If there was dust sublimation, again, what sort of time scales and what mechanisms caused all this? And also what happens if we take non-LTE effects into account? So I really think as an observer, I could really use some input from dust uh, modeling and dust theory, uh, our colleagues who worked on dust theory, which would be really helpful, I think. Um, yeah, so that sort of concludes my quick talk. Um, and I'll leave this nice image up and take any questions. Thanks very much indeed, Savisha, for, uh, yeah, it's, um, that, that, it's, it, it's strange, it's so strange. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of questions, so please do um, indicate in the chat or put your hand up. Uh, I see, uh, yes, there's some, somebody whose name I, is just SU. I'm, I'm sorry if the rest of your name isn't appearing, but it's please do Suzanne. go ahead and ask. Oh, hi, Suzanne. Hi, yes, do go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, you, you asked about input, about dust. Uh, I, I think the, that there is some indication that there is dust, but I think it's not the dust that is causing the dimming. Uh, I think if, if you would have any dust forming as close as that to the star, it should be very, very, very transparent. So, so it could scatter light and that, that, I mean, as we heard in the previous talk, that there is, okay, that was Antares, but still, that there is uh, indications of dust very close to stars and so on. But, but I think the dust should be very, very transparent. So I, I don't think one should exclude this dust forming and that doesn't mean it has to move out of the way very fast, as you said, like with a hundred kilometers uh, per second or something like that. But that in, in, in my, opinion is not causing the dimming drop of light. Great, thank you. Yeah, that was very helpful. Okay, are there any further uh, questions? Uh, there must be, um, there must be many. <laughs> I'm, I suppose, I suppose one obvious question from this is, is, is what would you predict would happen next? Um, <laughs> um, I'm honestly not sure because I mean, we sort of expected after this event that Beetlejuice was re will return to its normal behavior. But like I sort of, like I mentioned with the current, the way the light curve is still behaving, it it's, hasn't really returned to its normal behavior yet. So something is happening in there. <laughs> Yes, I, I mean, there's a comment from um, Renada. Do you want to to say that or? Um, oh, I can't uh, see the chat, but. Uh... OK, if, if you, you, you just put a Renada uh, Constantino Verantova, just was, was, is that you? Yeah. So do you want to ask it or shall I read it out? OK, I'll read it out. Cool spots are unusual for Betelgeuse. Up to now, only bright convective cells are observed. The dynamo there is not an interface, but a local one. How can the appearance of a cool spot be explained? Um, yeah, okay, so I'm honestly not very sure about the exact mechanism because we sort of expect this, um, this hot and cold component to be sort of hand in hand. And uh, so 
what we were sort of thinking is if you do have these hot convective cells, then at some point we do need to see a cold convective cell as well, sort of showing up on the other side. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me because certainly in the radio, we see small fluctuations, which are both brighter and dimmer than the average. I, yeah. I mean, I wonder whether the, I mean, in a way, the definition of what's a bright cell or a cool cell depends on what you take as the, the background. So yeah. it's quite a difficult Absolutely. concept. Yeah. Um, okay, Graham. Graham has a, a contribution. Yeah, I was just um, wondering, are you continuing to monitor? Yes, uh, uh, yep. So we have our JCMT um, monitoring still going on and uh, some NOEMA monitoring as well. So we're hoping to continue this for a little while longer. I think that's a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, are there any more questions? Um, uh, Theo. Yeah, no, I was just wondering, uh, relating to, to what uh, Suzanne said before, even if the dust is very uh, translucent and, and doesn't absorb a lot, only scatters, couldn't that still cause the dimming, just scattering light out of our line of sight? Uh, or, or... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think dust could have some sort of contribution, but I think what we, the big takeaway that we find with the submillimeter dimming and the fact that we're seeing straight through the dust into the photosphere is that a very big component of the dimming was a, is not a result of the dust. Okay. If, if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is there anybody further? Uh, anyone anyone else wants to come in? Um, if if not, then as we're uh, well, we, we we have another five minutes before the break. So, because uh, Thavish has uh, presented an awful lot of information very uh, concisely, so uh, do do come in if people have questions or comments. Uh, yes, I see another hand raised. Shaz Shazreen. Sorry, I've been in and out, so I might I might have missed it. Is it possible from the submillimeter to say something about the rotation of the star? Um, these imprints that there's been some that it rotates quite quickly. So I was wondering if in the submillimeter you can say something about that or not. Do you have um, lines? At at the moment, um, so we're, we haven't looked at the lines yet. We're getting the lines. Um, we haven't looked at them yet. Um, so I can't say too much about the rotation and I'm honestly not very sure how, uh, like, I don't know how that could be done, but I could ask, okay. ask around and get back to you about that. Yeah, I think, I think from the lines, you could probably measure, but I think it's hard because of all these convective motions and everything. So that's why it might be nice to have different constraints with different wavelengths with different measurements for the rotation rate. That would be really nice. Thanks. Very nice talk from what I got to see. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I, 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 Shazreen, I guess you've seen um, Pierre's rotation measurements. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. But of course, that's at a different layer from, from what uh, different wavelengths probe, which could be very interesting. Uh, I see another hand. Is Graham, do you have another question? No, I think you covered it. I think, you know, the uh, Pierre's measurements, you can see the, you know, the tumbling forward in the rotation close to the star um, and that, that gives you that five kilometers per second so I think yeah I think the rotation is pretty tied down but if you're talking about um, spots rotating off on and off the star the time scales for that are very very long very long years many years so I don't think that's going to be an issue for us um, I, though I did have one other point is that um, our modeling of uh, observational modeling of Betelgeuse and Tari suggest that the submillimeter is probably formed sort of quite high in the photosphere in the cooler layers. So um, the, definitely I, I, I do worry that when you have these dynamic events that the, the TIO and the submillimeter are sam sampling regions a bit further out and that could be a very good clue about the time scales and the shock mechanisms and things like that. Um, so I, I really, it's nice to better pin down exactly where these the emission from the submillimeter actually comes from. Thank you. 
Uh, can I just remind people to learn? Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, that, that's, but, but, but I'm glad I asked you second uh, time anyway. It's an interesting contribution. Are there any further questions or comments? Um, okay, well, don't forget that we're going to have a, a whole session discussing Battle Girls and other super giants after the break. So please, uh, you know, think about what you think is important. And uh, I mean, don't worry about bringing out things which you think are really long shots or you're, you're not sure if they're sensible suggestions because the whole point of having a discussion in a meeting like this, which will not be recorded, is for people to bounce things off each other. And even if they, they turn out not to be workable, it's usually, you're usually not the only person who will be thinking, I wonder if that could be the case, even if it turns out to be not the case. And sometimes people will come up with completely novel ideas that uh, are, are actually really, really useful. So I hope that everybody will come back uh, for the discussion session after the break. Meanwhile, the posters are still there in gather time. And I should remind people also that there is the, if you haven't already completed the diversity survey that's been put in the announcements and been circulated, uh, please do it just once only. But I, I think that it's, uh, it's only, it literally just takes a minute or something. And, and it's very useful to reveal things to us. Um, it, it's completely anonymous as well, but the statistics are, 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 are revealing. So, um, Thank you very much again to all the contributors in this session. And also at this point, thank you very much to um, the organizers, particularly in this session to Silke for taking care of all the technicalities. But I, 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 th I think that the whole of the SAC and the LOC, and in, in particular, um, uh, Marie and uh, Tysa have, have done a superb job getting us this far. And I look forward to seeing you all again in uh, at quarter past the hour in whatever time zone you're in. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Actually, Thais and I would like to still say something before we all move off to of the Of course, discussion. I'm sorry. I, I, I had written no, down to ask if you had any announcements. Like <laughs> no, no problem at all. So we would like to thank all of the participants and speakers, the poster presenters, but especially our wonderful SOC and LOC for this conference. You've all made this virtual conference a, a real success. And we hope that you had, uh, well, you learned a lot of things and had a great time. I, I certainly learned many things. And hopefully you were able to meet up with old friends and make new contacts as well. So as uh, Anita already mentioned, Slack will, will still be there. Uh, so please continue the offline discussion. All the talks are going to be on YouTube with timestamps so we can easily uh, swap between uh, speakers. So continue the offline discussion there, but keep in mind that it's a free version of Slack. So some um, comments will start to appear, uh, disappear after a while. So keep that in mind. Our gather time will be fully functioning um, for the rest of the weekend, but then afterwards, afterwards we're going to phase it out. So that's going to stop to exist. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. <laughs> Probably virtually first, so for example, the GAPS meeting in May. So that's organized by the IU Working Group on Red Giants and Super Giants. Please check it out. But especially we're looking forward to seeing each other uh, in real life and hopefully the IU Symposium in Leuven in November can go ahead as planned. So thank you all again very much and hopefully we see you at the discussion and if not, um, enjoy the rest of your week. So thanks again. I see there's still a question for Miguel. I don't know. Yeah, I just would like to thank uh, all the LOC and SOC, but particularly Marie and Taisa for all the job they did for this conference. I think it's uh, amazing that we were able to gather uh, everyone from all around the world. And uh, I know they've been working on that for many, many months. And I think we, we cannot have a round of applause uh, because we are not uh, in person. But I think we can all uh, use the reaction to uh, really uh, clap everyone and uh, particularly uh, Marie and Taisa because it's really amazing what they did. Thanks, Miguel.